Welcome to Reframed, a podcast created to educate, encourage, and inspire parents and professionals. The research is clear. Parenting a child that has a history of loss, abuse, neglect, or trauma requires parenting skills and insight to be reframed. We partner with child welfare experts to bring you evidence-based and research-driven information. Reframed host, Emily Moorhead, LPC, and guests strive to make an impact on our world by creating conversations about topics that are important to you, your family, and our communities. Hi, and welcome back to Reframed. I'm your host, Emily Moorhead, and today I'm joined with my colleague, Heather Rogers. Heather, tell me about yourself. Hi, Emily. My name's Heather Rogers. I am a licensed professional counselor in the state of Texas. I have been working at Gladney for 14 years, um, and I've worked primarily with birth parents during that time. Um, I also now currently supervise the Gladney home, um, and I'm working with teenage girls in foster care. Our goal is to help find them permanency through adoption, and I'm happy to be here. I'm glad you joined me. You and I actually hosted a grief support group for birth parents, and so I thought we could take a little bit about our experience with that and your experience working with birth parents and talk about the grief and loss process during adoption. So I guess first things first, what would you say to a woman who is tuning into this podcast who wanted to know if her grief was normal? I think that's a great question. And I just want to say, I think this is such an important topic that we're covering. I think sometimes this doesn't get enough acknowledgement um, just in general in society. Um, so a woman that was asking if her grief is normal, um, I would say normal is such a different and hard word to, to give a definition of. Um, so being able to answer that question really means that someone has to know themselves and know what is normal for them. Um, when we talk about grief, we usually think there's five stages of grief and, and we hear them and it's denial, anger, guilt and, par- guilt and bargaining, depression, acceptance. Um, and that's true. And, and those are stages of grief, but it's not cookie cutter. And so I know we'll get a little deeper into this, but I think it's important for someone to recognize in themselves that, you know, if they're having a, a really rough time and, and they need to take a day off or stay in bed or can't stop crying for a day, that's normal. But if that day becomes weeks or months and they still haven't been able to see some light, um, that's that would be something that would we would say, hey, it's time to really seek some some professional help or make sure that you're talking with someone about what's going on. Yeah. When we, when we work with birth parents, I mean, typically they're choosing to plan adoption because they, you know, have big hopes and dreams for their child. Um, and they also would love to parent their child, but they don't feel like they are equipped or able to at that time. I think sometimes when we think about grief, Um, We think about death, right? Like that's kind of the word that's associated with death. Um, And what I think that we see with birth parents is that their grief is this kind of like ambiguous loss. Um, They didn't lose a child to death. Um, Their child's still alive, but they're not actively parenting or actively, you know, in the day-to-day trenches of parenting. So talk to me about that that loss experience specifically. Sure. I think... I think that ambiguous loss is a really difficult grief experience because especially in adoption, um, a birth parent's loss and grief, um, is happening simultaneously with someone else's joy. And so society doesn't always recognize the heartbreak that comes with adoption. It, typically recognizes the celebration and the joy that comes with creating a family. Um, And although that is absolutely something that should be celebrated, I think it's really important that we have to acknowledge that that does first come out of a loss and a loss of someone not being in a place where they can parent their child. And, and even if that woman 100% felt like adoption was the best plan and that was her goal. And she knew that she wanted her child to have a family um, that she chose um, through adoption, it still comes with grief. And so to be, to be experiencing that grief and that loss while also knowing that 
you know, there are some parts of it that are happy because this family has been created. And um, especially today, women typically, if they choose, can see how their child's doing. So see this child growing and thriving um, and happy. It is a very conflicting feeling of grief and loss because it's it's saddled also with joy in between of being able to see that a child that they love and care for is doing well and thriving. And so it's, it's a really challenging experience to go through. Ambiguous loss is hard. I remember the first time um, that I kind of experienced that I had the opportunity to be with a birth parent during their relinquishment. So when they were signing their parental rights away um, and that was hard Um, one of the hardest things I've ever seen actually. Um, and then she wanted to have the adoptive parents take the baby home from the hospital. Um, and so she was grief stricken. Um, but it didn't look like grief. It was fascinating. She was so joyful to place the baby in the adoptive parents arms and they were so, so sad that she was going home without the baby. And so it was this really interesting experience of, what my preconceived notions were about what adoption grief looked like. And, and then she went home and I'm sure it looked different for her and they went home and I'm sure it looked different. Um, but just kind of normalizing that everyone's experience in it is different. Um, and that birth parents are so proud of placing their babies in those adoptive parents arms. Um, and it also can be hard like at the same time and that doesn't match normal grief. Right. Right. And I think one of the things that's so important to know is that grief and joy can exist simultaneously. And I've heard you say this before, and I I just think it's such an important thing to um, to acknowledge that um, those two things can live together because we can be heartbroken, but we can also still experience happiness. And and those things can happen even even in minutes of each other. Um, and so um, it's important to recognize that that, that is normal um, and, and that that's okay. And I think, you know, one thing that I know that we try to do at Gladney and, and we also want to normalize is that, um, you know, grief looks different on everyone. And so we want people to be prepared. We want women that we're working with to be prepared for, um, for that grief to come, but, but it is hard to prepare someone for something that we don't know exactly what it will look like. Um, I worked with so many women who, um, were so happy with the family they had chosen and, and felt really happy, um, to see their, that family that they helped create. And so maybe their grief didn't really hit them until two, three months down the road. And then I would get a call saying, oh my gosh, I thought I was fine. And now I can't get out of bed this week because I saw a baby at the grocery store. Um, And I think just really normalizing that that's okay. Um, Or for the woman that, you know, immediately when she goes home from the hospital has that just heart wrenching experience right then, but a couple months later is able to start seeing some light and feeling a little bit more like herself. That's okay too. And I think, it's, it's important to express about grief that it's not, it's not a cookie cutter and it's not a straight timeline. Um, you know, I, you can't see a, a dr- me drawing anything right now, but you know, I, I love the, the illustration of someone wanting grief to be a straight line, but really it kind of looks like a scribble tornado on a piece of paper. And that's, that's so true. Um, there's no rhyme or reason. There's no right way. I recently, heard that um, one of the biggest problems when we're having a problem is how we judge ourselves in the problem. So, you know, someone who's grieving, um, for them to judge what their process is like, oh, this isn't normal, or I'm doing this the wrong way. Like, that's the problem is that we're judging ourselves, but feelings are for feeling and to allow ourselves to feel it. I can imagine that, you know, anniversaries, um, birthdays, that those are probably extra hard. Uh, what would you tell a woman who is kind of getting ready for one of those moments? I think it's really important for us to be able to acknowledge the hard times. Um, I think it's really important to give ourselves grace, um, make sure that we've built in some self-care 
um, for those days. Um, and also to just really, you know, my hope is that birth mothers everywhere have at least one person at the very minimum, one person that can be a support to them. And so giving that person a heads up, Hey, um, my child's birthday is coming up. Hey, the anniversary of when I placed my child with his or her adoptive family. Um, I think we have a great example coming up, you know, soon as mother's day. So, um, that can be such a difficult day for birth mothers. Um, it, it can be uncomfortable because, I've asked so many birth mothers, what do you want to be celebrated on Mother's Day? And it's really interesting. And I think this is so important. Some women say, yes, absolutely. I car- carried my child for nine months. I chose life for my child. I picked a family. Um, and other women say, no, I, I don't. I don't want to be celebrated on Mother's Day because I'm not the person, you know, tucking this child into bed or, or putting a bandaid on a boo-boo. There's no, there's no right answer. There's no yes or no. So I think it's important for women to really think about and explore what works for them because that's going to be the most important part and then giving themselves grace on those hard days and really rallying their support system around them on those days so that they know that they have someone that they can lean into when they need it. How do people decide when it's safe to share that they're a birth parent, whether they're pregnant and they're planning adoption and they're considering, you know, placing their child for adoption or whether um, they've placed their child and a grief anniversary is coming up or a birthday or, you know, something like that. How do we kind of gauge who's safe or not safe to share our experience with? I think that is such an important um, question and something that's really important to think through. Um, You know, I have worked with women who just want to shout it from the rooftops. I'm a birth mother. I placed a child for adoption. um, And I've, I've, I've talked to them after that might have come back and and bitten them because they got so much negative feedback or or um, maybe not even negative but um, unwanted advice. 